everyone, I'm Jen Edgington, Curator of Education at the Kenosha Museum Campus. And I'm here at the Kenosha Public Museum today because we're getting ready to kick off Hispanic Heritage Month. Hispanic Heritage Month started in 1968 when Congress passed the bill allowing from September 15th to October 15th to be Hispanic Heritage Month. And that's kind of a different type of month, starting in the mid-month with September 15th. And the reason that that happened is actually because September 15th celebrates five different Hispanic cultures Independence Days. And then right after September 15th, there are three more Hispanic countries, including Mexico, Belize, and Chile. So September 15th to October 15th really celebrates the independence of those different Hispanic countries. And in America, it gives people with Hispanic descent a reason to celebrate who they are. Here at the museum, we decided we were going to do a month of programming on our Facebook page to celebrate different aspects of Hispanic culture and people and art. We hope that you enjoy it. Hi, my name is Mari Pavlik and I'm here at the Kenosha Public Museum and we're celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month. Today we're going to be talking about molas. So molas are a type of textile art that are made by the Kuna people of Panama. Um, and what they do, we have an example here. They put different layers of fabric on and then cut around that to create different geometric shapes, different um, symmetrical shapes, and a lot of the times it's animals. So in this one, it's fish, it can be all kinds of sea creatures. Um, some people even do cartoon characters or different like advertisements. So it can really be anything. Um, so it's the Kuna women of their people that do this textile art and they wear it on their blouses. So they'll sew it on the front and on the back and that's how they display their art. Hi, my name is Mari Pavlik and I'm the education assistant here at the Kenosha Public Museum and today we're going to be talking about the Aztec, the Inca, and the Maya. So a lot of people get these civilizations mixed up or they mix up different details about them but there are a lot of differences. So for example, the Aztecs lived in southern Mexico, um, central and southern Mexico. The Maya lived in southern Mexico, Belize, and Guatemala. And then the Inca lived in, um, mostly their centers are in Peru, but they did live all along the coast of South America by the Andes Mountains. The important city for the Maya people was Tikal, which is now located in Guatemala. And then for the Inca, it is the city of Cusco in Peru. Inca had some really interesting innovations, and I want to talk about two of them. So the first one was they had an extensive road system. So they were able to carry messages really far away, and it also helped them connect their different villages. Another thing, the second thing that we're going to talk about, that helped them stay connected was a thing called kipu. So kipu was a knotted string and the knots stood for specific things. So basically they used it like a calculator almost and to keep records and then they were able to easily transport that along their very extensive roads. One thing that these civilizations do have in common is agriculture. So they were able to support these huge empires and big economies through agriculture. So we're going to be talking a little bit more about Mesoamerican agriculture in one of our next videos. Hello everyone. So what we're going to be talking about today is agriculture and why it was so important to ancient Mesoamerican cultures and all the way until today. So one of the reasons why it's so important is just like today, people needed food, right? So they had to grow a lot of their own food. Um, some things like corn, we still grow a lot of today here in Wisconsin. So corn to ancient Mesoamerican cultures was called maize. Um, and maize came from an even older plant that had been domesticated and that older plant was called teosinte. And that also still grows today, but mostly people just still use corn. So some of the other things that people grew in ancient Mesoamerica were things like avocados, tomatoes, potatoes, and they even domesticated some animals like llamas and guinea pigs. 
And the llamas, the guinea pigs, and the potatoes were really big in South America. And they had over a hundred different kinds of potatoes. So another reason we wanted to talk about agriculture today is because it was one, pretty much the key reason why the Maya, the Aztec, and the Inca were able to have such huge um, empires and populations. So because they were so good at agriculture, they were able to provide for a lot of people. So that's how their cities got so big and their populations got so big. And we really want to draw our attention to that, especially when talking in a historical context, because these civilizations um, were thriving and flourishing well before European contact. So it's just important to remember that. Thank you for watching our video today. Make sure you look out for some of our other videos that we'll be doing for Hispanic Heritage Month, where we do some cooking tutorials with some of the food items that we talked about today. Hi everyone, I'm Jen Edgington, Curator of Education at the Kenosha Museum Campus, and I am here at the Kenosha Public Museum, and we are celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month. So today we're actually going to be making Mexican hot chocolate. Um, archaeologists have found evidence of chocolate drinks in Mayan cultures dating back to 3,000 years ago, and in Aztec culture about 1,200 years ago. So we do know that chocolate drinks were very popular during that time. We also know that sugar was not available, so they would actually use spices and herbs to hide the bitterness of the chocolate. So oftentimes when you have Mexican hot chocolate, it tastes a little different than the chocolate we usually get from the store in America. Um, so we're going to talk about how to make it, what supplies you need, and then we'll show you kind of the end product. So over here, are some of the supplies that you need to make Mexican hot chocolate. Oftentimes, you'll find in Mexican grocery stores or in the aisles that might sell Mexican food, hot chocolate mix that doesn't look like our instant packets. Instead, they come with little bricks about this size. They're in about that shaped box. And then when you unwrap it, you, look, you have this nice little block of chocolate. This is gonna be the chocolate that we use for our hot chocolate today. You also need a saucepan to heat up that milk and the chocolate, so we do have milk as well. You need a measuring cup because you need to be able to measure how much milk to put in. And then comes kind of the specialty equipment. Traditionally, you would find this with a clay pitcher. So in Mexican culture, um, it would have been a clay pot that you would have made the chocolate drink in. I have um, one from my own home, which is a metal pitcher we're gonna be using. And then, sometimes you see them a little bit more decorative, but this is basically our whisk. It's called a Molino. And so this here is going to be what we use to froth up our chocolate, which is just the way that we would be using to make our Mexican hot chocolate. So we are actually gonna to head to the kitchen to heat this up and really make it. So first things first, we want to measure out four cups of milk in our saucepan. And we want that to get nice and hot, but not boiling. So when you start to see the milk getting warm, oftentimes you'll see bubbling. Um, you can see some steam. Remember, we don't want it to boil. So I am going to drop a chunk of that block of chocolate in. So this block of chocolate is actually going to have some spices in it, like cinnamon, a little bit of cayenne. So Mexican hot chocolate, remember, is less sweet than the hot chocolate we have, and more um, you'll have more spices in it. So it smells really, really cinnamony, really, really kind of warm smelling. So I'm going to drop it in. And during this time, I'm just gonna let it melt. So you do wanna stir it a little bit. Um, you don't need to continually check on it and stir it, but you do need to make sure your milk does not boil. You want this whole thing to disappear in here. So it's one ounce, which is one of those little triangles per four cups of chocolate, or milk rather. So once everything is kind of melted, it will start to turn that darker brown color like hot chocolate that you're used to. You might have um, some sediment in there and that's okay. It's just little bits of chocolate, so it's not gonna hurt you. Um, and what we're gonna do after it is done is we are going to put it in our pitcher. 
Again, traditionally, these would be made out of clay. Sometimes you can find them at Mexican grocery stores. Um, and so we're going to put it in here. And then this comes the fun part. So we're using our whisk here. And we're not going to use it like we would traditionally if we were making cookies or anything else. We're actually going to use it like we're warming up our hands. So this is going to create a froth that's on top of our hot chocolate. So we're trying to froth it up, create that foam. You want to be careful because this is hot. And you can already start to see some bubbles being made. So you want to continue this until it's completely at your satisfaction of how bubbly you want it. Again, you're using your Molina, your whisk, like you're rubbing up your hands. Be very careful so you don't hurt yourself. And then when you are ready, you're going to put it in a cup and drink it. So today we're actually going to be talking about stories that came from Mexico. Some of these stories we hear as myths or folklores, but a lot of times they're actually teaching us things about the world around us and how to live. So I'm going to tell you about two different stories, one that focuses on the world around them and one that focuses on a lesson on how to kind of be in the world. So in our first myth today, we're going to be talking about two people, and this is actually an Aztec myth. So a long, long time ago, <laughs> there was an empire who had a young daughter. The young daughter actually fell in love with a warrior of her dad's. That warrior went off to war, and he was gone for a very long time. And she actually thought that he had died out in battle. She was so upset, she was grieving, she actually died of a broken heart. He, unfortunately, was not dead. He came home to find her passed away, he carried her out, outside of town, laid her down, dug a grave, and knelt by her grave. The gods actually saw this and decided to turn them into mountains where they stood. So now, there's actually, and they covered them with snow, and now those two mountain passes are known as these two lovers. And, and one is actually called the sleeping woman because of this story. The second story I want to tell you about is also from Mexico, and this one's dealing with a small sheep and a coyote. So the small sheep was actually very small, and the farmer decided to try and fatten it up. He went, took her out to a pasture of clovers where he tied her up and she started eating. The coyote came along to eat her. The young sheep was smart enough to say, wait a minute. If I take my time and eat these clovers, you actually will have more food if you eat me after. The coyote agreed and came back a week later. By then, the sheep was nice and plump, but they decided to trick him again. And they said, you know what's better than sheep? Cheese. And I'm going to show you where you can get cheese if you meet me tonight by the river. The coyote showed up at night. The sheep was there. And they pointed into the middle of the river at a beautiful, round, white, glowing object and said, that's the cheese. The coyote actually swam out and tried to eat the cheese, getting water all over its mouth. As you can imagine, it was the reflection of the moon. So yet again, the sheep was able to survive. The next day, it actually saw the coyote coming and decided that it needed to outsmart it again. It went and pretended to hold up a mountain with its feet and arms. And the coyote came by and asked what he was doing. And the sheep said, I'm holding up the mountain. I can't let it fall on my people. So the coyote actually switches places with the sheep and holds up the mountain. The mountain didn't need to be held up. The coyote realizes after hours of being hungry and tired that the sheep had tricked him yet again. On the last night, the coyote found the sheep, and the sheep realized he had no more tricks. And the coyote said he was going to eat him, and the sheep said, if you eat me, please be nice. I don't want to feel the pain. Eat me in one big gulp. So the coyote opened his mouth to eat the sheep, and the sheep ran at him and headbutted his teeth. And the coyote was so hurt, he actually 
went away and the sheep never had to deal with this coyote again. And when we talk about this story, we can actually see that the message is wisdom is always going to get you out of tricky situations. And that's what's trying to be told in this Mexican story. This time we're going to be talking about the ancient game Patoli. So a little bit more about the game itself. It is very old. It actually was played by Mayans and Aztecs and was played all the way until Spanish conquests in the 1500s. The game itself was played by both commoners and nobles. And there's actually some evidence that the emperor of the Aztec world would watch his nobles play this game. This game was rooted in gambling, but not money gambling. They would bring things that they had at home, blankets, food, gold, plants, all of those would be gambled during this game. And they needed six different things because there's six game plays. So first of all, the game board looks like this. This is the Patoli game board. It would be made on a mat. To play this game, and I'm going to give you the directions, you need six pieces for each and for two to four players. That can be whatever you want. Marbles, rocks, seashells, they all have to be the same color for each player though. So you want to make sure that you have between two to four different colored objects. Next, you want a dice. Back in ancient times, they would actually use beans. They would use black beans that were drilled on one side as their dice, and they would use five of them. If you want to be authentic, you can grab lima beans and paint on one side a little dot, and those are going to be your dice. Otherwise, you can use a dice, six-sided, and if you roll a six, just re-roll it. One thing to note really quick, though, is that we're assuming how to play this game. There were no written directions, and actually, after the Spanish came, they kind of erased a lot of the traditional indigenous culture of that area, so we're assuming how to play. So when I talk about the rules, they may be very different from how the Aztec played. But we have the six things that would go on the game board. We have our dice ready to go. And hopefully we have our game board. And to play, we're going to take turns. We're going to actually make it really easy and say that the youngest person goes first. And they start on their starting point, which will be right next to the center right here. The goal of the game is to get around the entire board, around the X, and to get your piece off. If you land on one of the rounded places, you get another turn. If you roll all five with the points up, you also get another turn. So the way you move, the youngest player goes first, starts in their starting point, rolls their dice, either a dice normally or those five beans, and however many of those dots are up, that's how many uh, places you move. The whole goal is to get all of your six pieces off. And so when I talked about back in uh, the Aztec days, where they would bring six different things to gamble, that was because one, one thing would be for each uh, marker off the board. So to win, again, you want all of your markers off. Your end one is kind of the opposite end of where you started. So you're going to go around clockwise. You'll end on your same kind of like part of the X. Okay. Well, we hope that you enjoy the game. We hope that you play it at home and let us know how it goes. Hi, everyone. It's Jen Edgington, Curator of Education at the Kenosha Museum campus. And I'm here actually in the kitchen of the Kenosha Muse or Public Museum. And I am going to be teaching about how to make tortillas today. Tortillas have been around for thousands of years. Um, when the Spanish actually came to Mexico, they did notice that they were using unleavened kind of round bread, which we now know as tortillas. Corn itself has been grown and farmed for about 7,000 years. It actually originated in kind of that Latin American area, and then spread from South America to North America. We are going to be using some kind of traditional ingredients today. We have our masa here. This is actually Spanish um, 
kind of corn flour. So it's different than cornmeal that you might get at the grocery store. If you want to make tortillas, you want to get a bag of the masa. To make masa, they would take whole corns, they would cook them with lime or wood ash for a long time. Then they would rinse that out and then grind it into a dough. And that would make fresh masa. This is not fresh masa, this is processed. So this again is that corn flour and our start of our tortillas. So we need to have our masa. We need to have hot water, which I do have here. I have one and a half cups. And we have a bowl to get started. So we're gonna kind of get started and we'll try and make it as we go. So I need two cups of the masa. And I already have my hot water because I did it beforehand. And this is one and a half cups of hot water that I'm gonna pour in. You might wanna add some salt to the masa before you add the water, and that's fine too, but um, we didn't add any this time. You wanna stir it up, you can use your hands or you can use a spoon to create a nice little dough. Once it hits this level though, you're gonna to have to use your hands. We want to keep kneading it until it makes a better ball. Mine is pretty crumbly, so you might want to add just a little bit more water depending. And then once it's in a nice dough, you want to let it sit for 10 minutes. All right, whenever you're ready. So we have here a tortilla press, and this is actually how we're going to make our tortillas nice and flat. So we're going to just um, put in, you can use plastic wrap, I have wax paper. So we have one piece here and we're going to take just a small amount of the tortilla, make sure it's nice and well rested, ready to go. You can make it into a ball. Then we're going to put the other one on top. You're going to close it and press it down. And we have the start of a tortilla. Once you have your tortilla nice and flat, you're going to want to put it in an oiled pan very carefully and let it cook for just a few minutes on each side. You want to keep your eyes on it so it doesn't burn. It cooks very quickly, less than about four minutes. So make sure it's a nice quick one and then you have to restart the whole process again.